Jeremiah chapter 3 is pretty much a singular focus and, and content there about uh, Israel and the, and the sins of Israel and how Israel's backsliding and hard and um, how God wants Israel to turn back unto him. And he starts off here just saying that, you know, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? So, you know, even in God's law, when people got divorced and, and a, a, a wife was put away from a husband, if she goes to be another man's husband, or another man's wife, excuse me, she's not allowed, and then something, you know, they break up or he dies or whatever, something happens for her to split from him, she's not allowed to go back in God's law back to that first husband. And so he's saying, he's saying, look, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him and become another man, shall he return under her again? Of course, no. I mean, the answer is no. And God's word, he says, no. Why? Because it's, you know, she's polluted, as it were. She's, she's, she's been defiled, in a sense, by, you know, by another man. And God says, no, you cannot come back. You can't return under your first husband. But he's likening that, and, you know, the Bible calls when, um, except for the one valid reason for divorce, which is for the Bible says for the cause of fornication, you know, prior to the consummation of a marriage, someone's put away. For any other reason, if someone's put away and then they, they go and marry someone else, they're committing adultery. The Bible's clear about that. That, that is, is just as, you know, it's, it's basically you're committing adultery because you're, you've made a vow till death do us part. You, you've consummated that marriage. You're together. You've broken your word. And now you've gone and, and you know, joined yourself unto another person. And by so doing, you know, that's adultery in God's eyes. So that's what the Bible explains. And now he's, so he's saying here though, he's using that illustration and comparing that with the children of Israel and their backslidings from him because what they did was they turned unto these idols. They turned unto false gods. They turned their back on God and just embraced false religion, false, you know, some idols, some, some false god of you know, the people of the lands that were about them or whoever it is, some false god and, and have just completely left who they were symbolically married to, right? The person that, that had brought them out and even made a great nation out of Israel and, and out of Abraham and, and the covenants that were made with him. You know, he is their first husband and they have turned from him and cleaved unto these other false gods and unto other men as it were. Right? And he's saying, look, when that happens in the law, are they, you know, can you even turn back and go back to your first husband? No, it says, but thou, and continuing on here in verse 1, he says, but thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. So when it says there, it says, you've played the harlot with many, you, you've gone after many strange gods, you've gone after many people, you've turned your back on me. He's saying, but return to me. He's saying in the law, you wouldn't do this with your wife, but he's saying, you've gone after other strange gods, but I still want you to come back to me. Even though that's not the way it happens in, in your physically, in your human relationship, but, but I am saying, come back to me and I'll receive you. He says, lift, lift up thine eyes unto the high places and see where thou hast not been lying with. In the ways as thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. And he goes on and on about, the, about you know, how bad they are. Flip back, if you would, real quick. We're coming right back to chapter 3, but go to chapter 2. We'll look at verse number 19. And we're preaching about backsliding this morning and getting away from God and, and turning yourself from God. Because you're going to find when, when we see these references to backsliding is that the only result what God wants you to do is turn back to him. And that turning is repenting. He wants you changing. He wants you turning back to him because somewhere along the way, you've gotten a little bit lost. Somewhere along the way, you've ended up turning your back on God. You've ended up turning and going the other direction. See, in our Christian life, in our Christian experience, in, in, our, in our lives, the moment you're born again, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you become a new creature. You have the new man inside of you. You're spiritually a babe in Christ. There's a lot for you to, to learn and you need to grow. 
And, and the way that you do this is by walking the Spirit, getting in the Word, learning, listening, getting, you know, receiving teaching. And in so doing, you're, you're growing closer to the image of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the goal. That's the direction that we're headed. So let's just say, you know, you're born into the spectrum by becoming a believer. You've got Jesus Christ over on one hand. So you're born, you're spiritually a babe, you're an infant. The goal is to be continuing to move on this path of growth spiritually and continuing to grow and to grow and to grow. And obviously we're never going to make it to the end in this lifetime while we're still in this flesh. We're, you know, we're imperfect. We're not going to achieve this sinless perfection of being exactly like Christ because we're sinners. But we're still continuing. We should be continuing to be on this path and, and making the changes necessary. And, you know, as you grow, just like with children, usually what happens is that the growth is pretty quick at first. It should be. If, you, if, you've, if you're in the right environment, especially, you're going to have a pretty significant growth. But as you get a little bit older, that growth is a little bit slower, right? But you still, you're still facing and trying to go this way. On the other hand, you have, you could have, you could put Satan on the other hand, right? There's extreme wickedness. No matter where we're at on our, our growth spectrum, we always need to be facing this way right. and growing and, and moving this way at whatever speed that may be. Because as soon as you start to go this way, this is the backslide. That's right. And what happens is that the, the, think about like you're, you're going uphill, trying to continually achieve more and get sin out of your life. And, and, it's, and it's a series of struggles and it's not always easy and you're combating the flesh. It's hard to, to grow sometimes, especially after that, that initial phase. You, you know, kind of get it, you know, you become a, a, young, a young adult maybe and spiritually. And then it gets a lot harder, and you got to work harder to continue that growth and to make some uh, significant strides. And as soon as you start to turn back, it's really fast going back down that hill. That's right. And that's why it's referred to as backsliding. I mean, that, you have that, that, that visual representation of sliding. When you're, when you're pushing upward, that's hard. Sliding back, that's easy and it happens real fast. And then if you, you know, in order to turn around and come back, you got to start going right back up that hill again. So we want to try to make sure we get to the point where we don't backslide. Now, inevitably, I think it, it happens with everybody at some point and to some degree because we're not perfect. But you don't want, you, you, we have to be really diligent and careful so that it, at whenever that does happen, we're quick to turn back and say, oh, no, and, and turn to God again. Amen. And, and, to not, and to not allow ourselves this, this uh, exponentially increasing speed of going down. I mean, it, it's, it's, this is in God's word, but it's interesting when you see just personally. And the longer you, you, you are in church, you'll see it happen. I've seen it happen in, in my experience, in my decade or longer, however long I've really been solid in going to church and kind of recognizing and seeing the, uh, you know, the, the way things happen, the way people are, and, and seeing people who are real solid, really good, uh, faithful, dependable, uh, God-fearing, you know, church-going individuals, working for God, doing the work, people you'd never think would be moved, how quickly, how really quickly people can just completely get out of church, turn back to all of the things that they used to do, you know, what, before they started cleaning up their lives. It's a really quick progression. That's, that's the danger of this. It's like, you know, you can even look at the children of Israel and it's like, you know, God performs all these miracles and they're just completely evident. And they're like, yeah, God, we're going to serve you. We, you, know, you know, we're accepting everything you got here, your word, your law. We're going to follow your law. We're going to do this stuff. And how quickly then it's just, just turned on other gods, turn on other things and, and just completely losing their faith, if you will, in the Lord. 
and, and how fast that can happen, even with all the evidences in their life. Look, it's no different for us, and we have to be aware of that. I've seen people, like I said, that, that have been coming to church faithfully, going out soul winning, pillars in a church. And you see them, oh, they weren't in church today, they weren't in church that, you know, like, and, and just all of a sudden, before you know it, they're not in church anymore. And then it's like, you hear about them, you see them somewhere, you run into them, and it's just like they're completely in the world. Going back to just watching football on Sundays, drinking with their friends, doing what, whatever the case may be in their life, right? I mean, whatever it was that they were really into before they got on fire for serving God, it's just, they've got, you know, they made a lot of progress. They made a lot of changes. They sacrificed a lot of things and were moving in the right direction. And then all of that wiped away. I mean, it could be years of progression wiped away in a matter of weeks or months. It happens that fast to go all the way back to square one. And I've seen it happen personally, and it happens, and this is a subject we want to talk about today, and because we don't want to get to that point. I mean, look, if you're here this morning, you're in church, I assume it's because you love God, and you want to make changes, and you want to do what's right, and you want to keep on heading this way. So while you're in this state of mind, let's get this settled, because the day will come where you're going to catch yourself sliding back, and we need to constantly be analyzing our life to make sure what happened? How did I get to this point and, and be able to realize, am I even backslidden today? So there's gonna be, we're going to go over that a little bit later in the sermon just, just to even identify, am I backslidden right now? First, I want to just, just go over what the Bible's talking about here in Jeremiah chapter 2 and 3 about backsliding and some of the symptoms and some of the things that we can see are evident when, the, when there is backsliding going on. And then we're going to um, kind of apply that to ourselves. So look at Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse number 19, the Bible says, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. For of old time I have broken the, thy yoke, and burst thy bands, and thou saidst, I will not transgress. When upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest, playing the harlot. Now, one of the things that, uh, you know, the Bible says here, God is saying, look, when they're backsliding, they've forsaken the Lord, and my fear is not in them. Now, I'm not going to turn there, but in the book of Malachi, the, one of the biggest problems with people who are backsliding is that they don't even realize that they're backslidden. They have, like, no clue about it. Here he's saying in verse number 20 in, in Jeremiah 3, 2, he says, For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou saidst, I will not transgress. Right? So God's saying, look, I've broken your yoke. I've freed you from the bondage. Right? I've saved you. I've delivered you. And you said, I'm not going to transgress. Right? I'm thankful to God that he saved me. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to follow the law. He says, and you said, I'm not going to transgress, but then he's like, but then you're on every high hill and under every green tree, you're wandering and playing the harlot and, and going after these strange gods. It's like, you're the one that said you're not going to transgress, and here you are now going after all these other gods. And the reason why I bring up Malachi is in Malachi, you know, the, these, um, these priests are being rebuked and saying, you know, they're saying, well, where did we rob you know, about the tithing? And say, well, where did we rob God? Wherein are we forsaking the Lord? What, you know, what do you mean we're, we're not doing this? And you know, it rebukes them for offering up the lame and the, the blind and the, you know, the, the bad offerings when they should be offering up good offerings. He, he rebukes them for not paying the tithe that they were supposed to be paying. And they're just making justification and excuses for themselves. And, they, and they're just blind to the fact that they're doing all these things. And this, again, this is, this is one of the inherent problems with backsliding is that you get blinded even to the fact that you're backslidden. Right. And if someone were to approach you in a backslidden state and to say, you've forsaken the Lord, you'd probably say, what are you talking about? And this is why I'm teaching this this morning because we need to be able to, 
either recognize it ourselves, try our best to be able to, 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 to keep ourselves in check so that we don't get to that point where you're just completely blown away. Or if you hear something, you hear it preached or you're, you know, somehow you're confronted with the fact that, no, you are backslidden and you've, you've forsaken the Lord, that you can remember these teachings and say, wow, I didn't realize, but yes, this applies to me and this fits me perfectly. So that you can have the proper heart to turn back to God. Because here's, here's the good news in all of this. Even if or when you go after the strange, God, you strange gods, you've turned your back on God, you've gone completely the wrong way, God still wants you to come back to him. And that's what we learn in, in chapter 3 there right off the bat. And that's where he starts off saying, you know, look, in the law, when you have other wives and they go be someone else, it's polluted. You can't go back to your first husband. But he's saying, you know what, with me, come back to me. Amen. And that is, that is great news, the mercy, the long suffering that our Lord has for us and how much he loves us. That even when we screw up and even when we turn our back on him and just completely go the opposite way of what he intends us to do, he still says, look, come back to me. Now, it doesn't mean everything you do is without consequence. The Bible says that we're going to, you know, we reap what we sow. However, no matter what we do, you can't, you can't just say, well, because there's consequence for my actions, I'm not going to turn back to God. That, that's the wrong attitude to have because then you're just going to heap up even more bad consequences to yourself. Look, cut your losses, turn back to God because he will accept you. Just like the prodigal son. He was a son of the father. He went out, wasted the substance, wasted his inheritance, partied it up, lived it up until he got, you know, broken down and, and abased because he was lifted up with pride. He, he came to nothing and realized, I need to go back. I need to go back to my father. And sometimes that's what needs to happen for people. You start, you know, you turn your back on, on God, you turn your back on the father. The prodigal son went his way. Dad, yeah, it's great. Thanks for everything, but I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore, essentially, is what he did. And he went off and just did his own thing. Do whatever he wanted to do. Well, he learned the hard way that it wasn't the right thing to do. But you know what his father was? Open arms, accepting him when he came back. He didn't go after him and make him come back. He didn't force him to come back. It was up to him to decide, yeah, you know what, I'm going to turn back to my father. Right. And when he did make that decision to turn back, his dad was there waiting for him Amen. and ready to receive him. And that's, you know, always know that, that no matter how far back you may slide in your life, it's never too far. Right. It's never too far to turn back to God. And I don't care, you know, one of the biggest problems with people getting out you know when people start to backslide oftentimes what goes hand in hand with that is getting out of church one of the reasons is because whatever whatever is appealing to you whatever sin it is that's creeping into your life that you've allowed to creep in that you've started to partake in oftentimes it will get preached on because if god's working through the man of god that's that's preaching you know they don't even have to know what's going on in your life personally I've, I know for a fact this has happened so many times. It's happened to me personally. I've had other people tell me, hey, you know, you preach this sermon and like, this spoke directly to me. And like, I have no idea, right? And that's happened to me before too. And, you know, in, in other churches I've been to, it's like, oh man, you know, that this sermon was directly for me without the pastor knowing anything about what's going on in my life individually, especially because, you know, when you've grown a little while, oftentimes you don't want people to know that you're in sin. I mean, you try to cover and hide it, even though you have your secret sin, your secret pleasure, whatever that is that you, you, know, you're, you just want to indulge in. So what happens, though, is that, you know, God's trying to speak to you and say, you know, you need to get right. And sometimes it thunders down and, and you get convicted and you're saying, wow, this is about me. But you have the choice to make at that point, because when you get confronted with your sin, you've got a choice to make. There is, there is no third option. You're either going to try to get right or you're going to get out and not want to be around that anymore. And, more, and too many times, people will hear the preaching, 
They don't want to experience the conviction that, you know, being brought under that. Like, oh man, that stings, that hurts. You know, I need to change, but I don't really want to because I like this sin. And what happens? Well, I don't want to hear this anymore because I really like what I'm doing and I don't want to give that up. And they'll get out of church and they'll stop coming. And then the floodgates are wide open for the, for the backsliding. Because what's, what's, what's being used to help you is the preaching from God's word and to help you get on the right path. And as soon as you do that, you're just, that, and that's where the slide really accelerates is when people get out of church. The one thing that's actually going to be the, probably one of the most important things to help you, people get out of church. And then what happens after that Sometimes it's, it's brought to light what they're involved in and people get embarrassed. Then they want to get right with God later because he's brought them low, right? And they've, they've got godly sorrow that work repentance in them and they've, they, they change and say, you know what? I need to get back right with God. But then for some reason they just say, well, I can't show my face there anymore. And, it, and that is such the, the opposite attitude of what you need to have. If God's already brought you low and humbled you, have the humility to go back to church. Look, in, in this church, no one's going to, you know, look down on you if you've repented from whatever it is that you've been doing. Amen. If, you, if you get caught up in, I don't I mean, drunkenness or fornication, or whatever it is. Look, there, and there's many things that the Bible says, I'm going to teach you that a little bit more tonight, of when we break fellowship with people, when people are going to be kicked out of church because of certain sins that they're in, whatever the case may be, when that person repents and they're humble and, they're brought, you know, and they're, they want to get right with God, you're going to be accepted back here and, and brought right back into the fold the same way that God wants you to turn back to him. Look, God wants you in church. He doesn't want you forsaking the assembly to, uh, you know, of yourselves together. We're not going to prevent you from being able to do that by not allowing you to go back in the right path. See, some people, they get so backslidden, they may need to be kicked out from the assembly because we're not going to allow the leaven to, to spoil the whole lump. And while you're headed this way, we don't, I don't want people headed the wrong way in this church because you're going to affect other people and, and get, you know, get them down that same path with you. Right. I want everyone, I mean, no matter what your rate is, I want people headed this way. And if you're starting to turn back this way, let's, let's get focused right back in the right direction. Now look at Jer Jeremiah chapter 3. We're going to start reading here in verse number 6. Because backsliding has, has everything to do with the direction that you're headed in your heart. It's a heart problem. At the end of the day, that is, that is what it boils down to, is, is what is it in your heart that you're, that you, you know, the actual, and that's not something that, that people can see. Now, your outward works will, will kind of manifest what's in your heart. But at the end of the day, you need to determine for yourself, which way am I headed? Which way do I want to head? Verse number six, the Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain under every green tree and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she returned not and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Of course, again, referring to idolatry. Verse number 10. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, saith the Lord. Now, the word feignedly means it's like, she, I mean, it wasn't with her whole heart. It was almost deceptively. It was, it was fake. I mean, the word feign means like you're faking it. So that's when people might say just with their lips, 
oh yeah, I love God and I want to do what's right. But in their heart, they don't mean that. It's just this outward thing, like you're trying to deceive someone into thinking. You know, it's like, it's like the husband that tells his wife, I love you, and then goes off and commits adultery. Ooh. It's feignedly, it's, it's fake. It's not real. It's not, you know, how could you possibly say that you love someone and then go and do that? That's what uh, God is saying that uh, Judah was doing. Judah as a nation, as a group of people, were saying, oh yeah, no, you know, we're not like Israel. We're turning to the Lord, but not really. They, were, they did not turn with their whole heart. They only did it with their lips. And when we turn back to God, our heart has to be in it. You have to turn back to God with your whole heart to truly turn back to him. I mean, that's, that's what God's looking for. He's looking at your heart. He's not looking at what you say. You know, people will say all the time, we go out soul winning. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Doesn't mean they're saved just because those words come out of their mouth. It's what is their heart trusting on for their salvation. If their heart is completely resting in what Christ did for them, then yeah, they're saved. If they're a whole heart, they're not trusting in themselves at all. They're, they're completely resting on what Christ did for them, then they're saved. But anybody can say, I believe in Jesus and not be saved. Anybody can do that. I mean, it happens all the time. People, people are deceived into thinking they're saved, but they're, but they're not because of what is in their heart, because of what is they're trusting on in their heart. So we need to put our whole heart, just, like, just as much as we need to turn our, put our whole heart on Jesus for our salvation, when we backside, God wants us to turn back to him with our whole heart. He doesn't want us holding on to a little bit of just, but I really want to keep doing this. Because that's going to keep you from growing and going in the right direction. That's going to hold you back. Verse number 11, And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. One of the other aspects here of... of um, People who are backsliding, backsliding Israel, it says in verse 11 that they, she justified herself. And this is what people will always do. When, you, when, you, when you're getting into sin, you're always justifying it. You're justifying yourself. Well, this is the real reason why it is. And, and that's the, 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 it's a bad attitude to have. God wants us to be able to, when we sin, acknowledge our sin confess our sin to him, be sorry for that, you know, be repentant and, and say, no, I'm not going to do that anymore and turn back to him. Say, you know what, God, I screwed up. I turned away from you. I got into this sin, but it's a sin. I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to go back and do what's right from here on out. That is the heart that God wants us to have. That's, that's the returning that he wants us to have to him. Unfortunately, what people often do is instead of having that attitude, they want to justify themselves and explain away why what they did, well, it's really not even that bad. It's really not even a sin. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. Now, the term backsliding in the Bible is used almost exclusively when God's people would go after other gods or idols. I mean, that's just the term. Not the concept necessarily, but the term itself, backsliding. And it's mostly found in the book of Jeremiah. They're con you know, Israel's constantly being told, you're backsliding, you're backsliding, you're backsliding. You know, return to me, return to me. And it's because they've gone after these false gods, these graven images, other gods than the Lord. Now, you may read the Bible and say, well, I don't worship any graven images, so how can I be backsliding then? Right? How can you be applying this term of backsliding? Well, you may not have a physical object of gold or silver and, and you know, carved out of wood, 
But what is your idol? Because what is an idol anyways? It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's what you're turning to instead of turning to God. I mean, it's a false God. It's whatever it is that you've created, whatever it is that you've imagined in your heart. And the, the physical object is just a manifestation of that, of just what it is that you're turning to that you've created in your mind or that you're going to instead of going to the Lord. And basically, you can ask yourself, well, what is it that has replaced God in your life? What is consuming your time that in turning to it, you've turned from God? We live a life based on values, based on what is important to us, right? And you're going to identify that, you know, whatever you claim is important to you, well, look at how you're spending your time. You may in mouth or in your lips say, well, God is the most important thing in my life. But then in your actions, when you just look, just take a step back, say, what did I do this week? Just everything I did. And just write down, what, what did I actually do? Well, I slept, I ate, I went to work. You know, I did whatever. Just, just what are all the things I did? How much time did I spend doing everything? And then you could determine for yourself, is God really the most important thing in my life? I mean, I say that it is, but is that where my whole heart is? It's a good way to determine where you're at, just in general, in relation to what you claim to be your values. I mean, whatever your values are, you ought to be living the way that, that reflects that. And you determine what the priority is, right? I mean, maybe you put God down at number four or five, whatever. I mean, it's not right. It's not, it's not what, where God demands to be. But if you're going to be honest with yourself, you know, you could look back and say, okay, well, is this, is this, does this match up with what, with what I think is right and where I should be in my values? And, and that's one of the ways that you can identify problems in your life. And, and am I living the way that I think I'm living or the way that I want to live? So how to identify if you're backslidden? One way is just ask yourself, has there been a time in your life when you were doing more for God? That's a very good indicator because, again, like I said, there's a progression. And if you're doing a lot to serve the Lord, you're going to continue to, to grow and to do even more. And if there was a point in your life when you were, I mean, you were soul winning, you're reading your Bible, you're praying, you're, you, you made the time to make all these things work, but now you're just not doing that much anymore, you're backslidden. You are not as far along as you were. I mean, that's, that's, that's an easy way to look at it and, and just think back and say, wow, well, what do I need to do to get back to that time? You know, I mean, just think about it. Say, am I backslidden? Am I, oh man, I'm backslidden. Am I headed back the right way? Or am I still continuing to slide further and further and further away from where I was before? Are you only giving lip service to how much you love God without actually doing it? You know, again, it's a way of identifying if you're backslidden. Are you finding yourself constantly justifying yourself to your, you know, I mean, to yourself or to others around you when you do the things you know you shouldn't be doing. Because, look, there's, there's a difference between sinning ignorantly, which means you don't know that something's a sin, and sinning willfully, which is, I know this is a sin. I've been convinced that the Scripture says that this is a sin, but I'm doing it anyways. Ignorantly, there is no reason for you to rationalize or justify yourself because you don't even realize it's wrong. As I mentioned before, uh, a week or two ago, I brought up my wife as an example of someone that when we first got married, she was a babe, when she was a babe in Christ, I mean, she wasn't a babe when we got married, but you know, she'd only been saved for about a year prior to our marriage. So there's a lot of things she didn't know and was ignorant of from scripture just because she'd never even heard it before. I mean, how, you don't know what you don't know. So if you're ignorant of something, and she had no reason to try to justify herself if I confronted her about a couple things. I didn't even know that was a sin. Okay, well, yeah, there's, there's no reason for her to try to justify herself because there was no thinking that this is even wrong. That's way different than someone who's read the Bible, heard the preaching, understands, and accepts what, what's taught. You know, it's just, you know, yep, that's right. For example, 
You know, the Bible teaches that we're not supposed to, to be of the world or to love the things that are in the world. The Bible says, for all the things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but of the world. And, and, you know, and, and, and scripture like that, and you say, yeah, you know what? I really know that, that and I've accepted already that this is true, that you know, I shouldn't really be getting into the Hollywood movies and the, the, the music and the stuff that's just really worldly, and I've already accepted that to be true, but I really want to do it. See, and I'm not saying you all, you, you know, maybe you disagree on one point on something like that, whatever. Look, whatever it is that you've received, that you say this is true, but you're doing it anyways, that is the biggest problem. Because right. then you start to justify yourself and you're going to try to rationalize. Say, well, I don't think this is really wrong. And you come up with whatever reason. And, and what happen, what, what, when that happens is you start lowering the bar. You start lowering the standard. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, even if you don't agree with me like 100% on what is, you know, when it comes to Hollywood movies or the, the music or whatever, it's best to abstain completely, even if you're not in complete agreement, because what's going to happen is that you're going to start lowering that. You say, well, this is okay in this situation, this situation, and you start adding more situations to it, and, it, and it's going to happen without you even really realizing it. It happens slowly. You're not going to go from, you know, yeah, exactly. Hymns to Megadeth, I was going to say, or, or, a, or a, a documentary to porn overnight. I mean, that's not going to happen like, you know, like so quickly. But what you're going to start to do is you start allow more things and you start to rationalize and justify more things. That is the backsliding trend. So the best way to, to just make it, because if you seriously care about it, you care, just say, you know what, I'm just going to, you know, if I know this is an issue for me and my flesh is really kind of driving me a certain way, I'm just going to cut it off and just be done with it. Because, I mean, let's face it, the TV itself, the, the apparatus, the device, is not inherently evil. It's electronics. It's displaying an image for whatever you want to put on that thing. But if you have a propensity, if you have this desire to constantly put wrong, bad, evil, wicked things up there, then the best thing to do is just to get rid of the thing altogether. Then you, then you don't have to worry about getting down that path. Now, look, if that's not an issue at all, then great. You know, play your home videos and your pictures and whatever else you want to put up there that you're completely fine and not, not any problems at all. I mean, we don't, that's one of the reasons why we don't have, you know, cable TV. There, is there maybe some channel out there that just doesn't have anything wrong with it? I don't know. Maybe there is. I don't know. Okay. Probably not, but maybe there is. I mean, between the, between the commercials and, every, you know, and everything that's on there, probably not. I mean, I'd definitely be inclined to say probably not, but I mean, there's probably, I don't even know how many channels there are these days. I mean, they make them all the time. And if it's, there's one just dedicated to stuff that's, you know, where they're not lying to you, and uh, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, right? The point is... Um, When you look at the totality of it, it's kind of like, is it even worth it? I mean, are you looking for that needle in this haystack where you're going to already have to subject yourself to stuff that's wicked and wrong just to find that one thing? And is it even really worth it? I, mean, I would say probably not. But you know, again, I don't want to get too far off on that tangent. The, the problem comes in is when you know something's not right and you're justifying it. Right. That is a big problem. And that is, that is a, a definite indication that you are backslidden. You start justifying more and more things to yourself, you're backsliding. Or how about not doing the things that you should? Because there's the sinning through doing things you shouldn't be doing, you know, be, you know, loving this world or whatever. But then there's also the things that you know you should be doing. And what happens here, again, you'll have the same thing of rationalizing and justifying. But I've also seen what people want to do, and this is an example that's come up recently, is people that will grasp for any type of justification from Scripture. And people will do this with other sins too. But the one that I'm going to bring up today is, is not doing something that you should be doing to make yourself feel better for not doing it. And the example I'm talking about here is soul winning because people want to come up with a reason why they 
I can't do this. Why? Because it's work. Because your flesh doesn't want to do work. And it is work to go out and to preach the gospel. So when you get lazy, when your flesh is over, when you're getting backslidden, you don't want to do any of that stuff anymore, you're going to try to justify that to yourself too. Well, I can't go out because whatever. And the worst thing that you can do is go to Scripture to say, well, uh, oh, actually, I shouldn't even be doing this. I have you in Luke chapter 10. Because this is, this is a, um, something I've heard recently as to a reason why some people might believe we shouldn't go door to door preaching the gospel. That this is that it's not right. Look at Luke 10. Look at verse number 7. This was, this was shown to me as the justification of, of not going out door to door soul winning. Verse number 7 says, And in the same house remain, eating and drinking, such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. See, right there it says, go not from house to house. That's it. Go not from house to house. And it's like this focus on one phrase, one sentence in the Bible that just says, go not from house to house, without even considering the context at all, as just using this as your justification to not go out and do the work. And you know the real reason why is because you're lazy. Because you don't want to go out and do the work. So you have to find some reason to justify it to yourself not to go out and do it. Because if this was talking about going out soul winning and, and preaching the gospel, then you have a contradiction in the Bible already. Because if you have one area where Jesus is saying, don't go house to house preaching the gospel, and then he says, go out and preach the gospel to every creature, and you have some people that never leave their house, how in the world are you going to preach the gospel to every creature if you can't go to their house? Or when the Bible says daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. But let's get this verse in context. And look, if you're being honest with yourself, this is what you're going to do. But if you're just grasping for any reason not to go do something and just justify yourself, go ahead. I mean, you might as well take Matthew 7 and just say, judge not. And not read the whole thing and actually have an interest in what it's actually teaching. And just pull out one phrase, one verse, whatever suits your fancy to justify yourself instead of having integrity of what the Bible's actually teaching. Because in Luke 10, let's, instead of just reading that one verse, let's start from verse number one, where Jesus is literally sending out his disciples two by two to preach the gospel. Because that is what he's doing. Verse number one, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whether he himself would come. Now, before I even get into this, look at, he's sending people to go and preach the gospel. Yet, the, the, the people who want to say, oh, we're not supposed to go house to house, what are, are, where are they being sent from? What are they being sent to do? No, they're relying on this lifestyle evangelism garbage of just, well, whenever something comes up somewhere in my life, then maybe I'll open up my, my mouth and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is, is that what Jesus was doing with his disciples of just saying, hey, go into these cities, get a job, hang out for a while, make friends with people, and then if it comes up and they're ready and they could see how well you're living, then you have your opportunity to give them the gospel. Not even close to what he's doing. He's sending them out to do work. That's why he says the laborer is worthy of his hire. Why? Because their goal and their job is to go out and preach the gospel. And they're going into a city to do it. Verse number two, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into, the har into his harvest. Go your ways. And look, the, the whole spirit of this, he said, look, the harvest is great. The laborers are few. There's few people that are willing to actually do the work. Pray there will be, be, be more laborers. But in so doing and justifying themselves, saying, oh, you shouldn't go to house to house, they're going to tell other people, oh, yeah, you shouldn't go house to house. Is that the spirit that Jesus had here? 
Oh, no, 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 don't, you know, I want everyone to be saved, but, but don't go house to house. That is asinine. That is ridiculous. Why would you throw a cloud or a damper over someone trying to fulfill the great commission of preaching the gospel and getting people saved by saying you shouldn't go do it house to house? There is no reason why any, any thinking Christian would do that other than to justify themselves. Just like the Calvinist wants to justify themselves for not going out and preaching the gospel because they say, oh, well, if God wants it to be done, it'll be done. And you can just rely on that instead of taking the responsibility that God has given you as an ambassador for Jesus Christ to go out and represent him and preach the gospel. Oh, well, God will just work it out magically himself and just, I don't have to worry about that. Someone else will do it. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. Again, another justification of your own sin and lack of willingness to do anything for God. But let's keep going here because I said we're going to get this in context. Verse number three, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse, and this is important, carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes and salute no man by the way. Wait a minute, you're not saluting any man by the way? Then where are you, you going to be preaching the gospel? And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. So in the context of him saying, Go not from house to house, he's saying when you enter into a city, you find someone who's going to put you up. Why? Because they were sent without a purse, without money, without script, without, they were sent without anything, just relying on what Jesus said to go out and preach the gospel. He's saying, you don't need anything to preach my word and proving a point, I'll take care of you. God will take care of you. You don't have to have a big savings account. You don't have to have hotels. You don't have to have anything to do the work of the Lord Anybody can do this in any financial situation. You can go out and preach the gospel and God will take care of you. You enter into a city, you find someone there who is a believer, someone who's going to set you up and be like, hey, yeah, come into my house. I'm hospitable. I'll help you out and you can stay here. And what he's saying is when someone receives you into their house, don't just go and stay with this person and then stay with that person and stay with this person. He's saying, just stay there. Amen. Eat what they give you. Sleep where they give you a place to sleep because you know what? The labor, because you're going out and working. You're not just hanging out at this person's home and just chilling there and not doing anything and kicking up your feet and having a Bible study. You're going out and doing the work and whatever they provide for you, eat it. Don't worry about it because the labor is worthy of his hire. So it says not to go house to house. He's saying just stay there. What's the point of moving into different people's houses anyways? I mean, it's going to take away from your work. Get established, get set up, have a home base, and go out and do your work. There is no reason to go from house to house. Just let that person take care of you for however long you're there. And then he says in verse 8, And into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. It's very, very, very plain what this scripture is talking about in context. I mean, you literally have to just completely yank it out of context to try to say that this is, that Jesus was teaching them as he sent them into the cities not to knock on doors and preach the gospel to people. All you're doing with that is justifying yourself and your lack of a willingness to go out and do the work and try to get God's stamp of approval on it. And see, when people want to justify their sin, they're going to try to do it any way they can. So a lot of times people will go to the pastor and, and try to get the pastor to say, oh yeah, in that, in that situation, you're fine, or, you know, whatever, because they know in their heart what they're doing isn't right, but they want someone else, and they'll find someone else to tell them, no, what you're doing is just fine. That's why the Bible says, you know, in the last days, people are going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Because all they want is someone to tell them that they're right and what they're doing is fine and not tell them the truth. They just want someone to scratch that itch. 
Tell me that I cannot do anything and I'm still right with God. That's what people want to hear. Why? Because it feels good to their flesh. Because the flesh doesn't want to work. The flesh wants to relax and sit down and not do anything. And that's why in Jeremiah, the Bible says that God's going to give them pastors and teachers. They're going to teach them the right way because people need it. We need church. To help get you right. Get you back on the right path. Not succumb to the flesh. Not justify your sin. Be confronted with it. And then have the right attitude that says, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to turn back this way. Justifying your sin as opposed to confessing and forsaking it can easily become a pattern. It becomes more and more of a pattern of just trying to justify yourself until you, you know, and it's going to lead you into more unrighteousness. And before you know it, you're just going to be like, how did I get to this point? It's because you've justified yourself every way along the path. And this is the way it is with almost all things. Like I said, you know, a person doesn't become a drunk in one night. It starts off with the social drink. It starts off with the occasion. It starts off with the, it's New Year's. So I'm going to have a glass of champagne. It comes off with, I got a job promotion. I'm going to celebrate and have some alcohol, whatever. And then it turns into, I'm hanging out with my friends. And you start adding more reasons to celebrate. I mean, this is, this is what we do when we say, you get in your mind, hey, it's a celebration. Well, then you want to start celebrating more and more things. I mean, look, I, I know this is the way it is because this is the way that I was when I was trying to quit drinking. I would say, well... I realized I got really bad to where I was drinking like a, a lot. I mean, regularly, a lot. And I said, well, because I, I didn't want to give it up, which would have been the right thing to do, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to hold on to that. So I said, well, only on special occasions. Friday. Yeah, the, and before you know it, the special occasion is Friday. Yo, it's just, well, it's my buddy's birthday. We're going to go out. Well, it's Christmas. Well, it's Thanksgiving. Well, whatever, you know, it's Independence Day. Well, I'm going to this rock concert. Well, I'm going, you know, and then it's the week's over and it's Friday. And all my buddies are going out. It's a special occasion I'm going to go out to. And, you know, and before you know it, it's like you're right back to square one. Because you've just justified everything else away and you start adding to that and it's, how did I get here again? Because you didn't have the right heart and the right attitude to begin with. And, and when you want to cleave or hold on to that sin, you're going to be right back where you started. You have to make a, a clean cut and sever it off and just say, I'm done with this. Amen. I'm completely turning from that to get it out. But you leave that door open even just, just a little bit, it's going to be kicked wide open. You need to close that door on sin and, and leave it closed. Just like a person doesn't get to the point of committing adultery in one night, I mean, by and large, it starts with the heart. It starts with bitterness. It starts with, with other things that happen in your home. It starts with you spending too much time then with people of the other gender. It starts with you making relationships and building up, you know, wicked relationships with people who are not your spouse. And then that becomes adultery. We need to be watching out for that. And then you, and you justify it. Oh, well, this is my work call. Oh, we're going out to eat to talk about work. Right? Start with that. And then, oh, we're going, hey, let's make this a regular meeting place. We're talking about work. And before you know it, you're not talking about work anymore. But that's how you justified it to begin with. And now you're just going out there. And now it's, well, hey, I'm going out here. You want to come with me? Well, you've already built a friendship and everything else, and you, you've built this bond with this person that's not your spouse. Okay. These are these things happening. I'm, that's why I'm, I'm explaining it to you so you can be aware and you can just watch out and keep yourself as far away from possible. Your know, Bible says flee fornication. Run away from it. Have nothing to do with it. Cut the ties that are going to lead you down that path. Backsliding is dangerous. Those verses about backsliding in Jeremiah, I didn't go through all of them. We read the whole chapter in chapter 3. But they show God's anger and punishment for backsliding Israel. 
It's, it's, it's not a light thing with God. Now, he wants them to return still, always. But it's not, again, it's, it's not just some light, light thing. Now, what causes people to backslide? We went over quite a few things, but I think one of the number one reasons, honestly, is idleness. Now, turn, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 16. We're almost done. Ezekiel chapter 16. It's one of the major prophets. You got Jeremiah, then Ezekiel, Ezekiel's. You got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 16. Isaiah, Ezekiel chapter 16 talks about Sodom. And if you wonder how can a place, how can a city, how can a, you know, a, a, an area get so wicked and just so vile and, 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 and so bad that it gets to the point where God has to destroy it with fire and brimstone. Like, well, how did that start? Before they got just, just really bad, the Bible explains how that happened. In Ezekiel chapter 16, look at verse number 49. Ezekiel 16, verse number 49. The Bible says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me, Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Now, just briefly, I want to point this out because people say, see, God didn't destroy Sodom because they were queer, because they were, you know, committing sodomy. Yes, he did. He explains these other, you know, these things and the, and the, 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 the kind of the root cause that led him down that path. But in verse 50, he says they were haughty and committed abomination. The abomination they committed was sodomy. And then he says, therefore, like right after and committed abomination before me, colon, therefore I took them away as I saw good. Now, it wasn't just about, I mean, it was everything, you know, combined, I believe, but it was still, that was kind of the final straw and they committed abomination. And then he said, that's it, that's enough, you're getting wiped out. People want to look at verse 49 and say, see, it was pride. It wasn't just pride. Pride was definitely a big problem there. It was pride, major sin. And again, with pride, you think, what do I need God for? You're lifting yourself up. Right. And that is a very good way to start to backslide. Yep. What do I need God for? Don't need him at all. I'm lifted up in myself. Fullness of bread, that's just being wealthy, having a lot of this world's goods and riches. Again, the pride and the fullness of bread go hand in hand because when you start to get real wealthy, you start to think, what do I need to rely on God for? I've got everything I need. All of my needs are met, so why would I have to worry about relying on God? And then it says, an abundance of idleness. Idleness means you have nothing to do. Because let's face it, when, when you're rich, when you're wealthy, and you're lifted up in yourself, what do you have to do? You don't really have to work that hard if you're already wealthy, you got all this stuff, right? I mean, unless you're super greedy, you, know, you might be just a total workaholic. But that wasn't their problem. They had abundance of idleness. That's what the Bible says, abundant. I mean, they just had so much time, I don't know what to do with it. And it says, Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So they didn't care about anyone else but themselves. You lift up with pride, you're focused on yourself. You, 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 know, you have the fullness of bread and all they care. They, they didn't use that to help other people out. Nope, it was all about them. And they had all this extra time. Now, when you have all, a whole bunch of idle time that you don't know what to do with it, that is the perfect time to backslide and get into sin. Because when you don't know what you're going to do with your time, you're just going to do whatever comes into your heart. The Bible says the heart is wicked. Above all else, you know, you know who can know it? The Bible says, you know, our, our hearts are not just always right with God. If you just do everything that comes into your heart, it's probably not going to be the right thing. We need, to, we need to work on our hearts and we need to walk in the spirit to do what's right. But in order to do that, you need to have a plan. You need to know what you're doing with your time and plan it out. 
in order to keep yourself from having an abundance of idleness. Now, sometimes people can find themselves with an abundance of idle time. There's many reasons for this. And some of them could be legitimate, some, you know, whatever. Men, men may get laid off from work or get injured or something, right? That's going to give them now you have all this abundance of idle time. Let's say it's legit. I mean, someone gets hurt on the job. Well, I can't go out and work because I got hurt. Well, you might find yourself now. I've got a bunch of, there's a bunch of time. I'm laid up. What am I going to do with that time? Or some other reason why, you know, the Bible says, first of all, that men should be working. Genesis 3.19 says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. As, and uh, God was speaking to Adam. You're going to work by the sweat of your face. That was, that's what's in the cards for Adam. And in Exodus 20, verse 9, the Bible says, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. You know, and the seventh day is the, is the Sabbath to the Lord. Six days are given to work. Man's expected to work and work and work. And that's what God wants us spending our time doing, working for him, Working for your family, you know, just getting to work, not having idle time. But if you find yourself with idle time, the way that you're going to not have idle time is by saying, okay, first of all, I mean, you should, you should have your time scheduled out already. But even then, even with a schedule, sometimes something might change. That's going to give you, I mean, think about that. Let's say everything's going well, I'm working, I'm going to my job, and then you know, like in my job, for example, the power goes out. Well, I can't work because I'm, I work at a computer. I need the electricity to do my job. So now all of a sudden I've got a block of time with nothing to do. You need to have a backup for yourself to not just be like, well, what am I going to do now? Well, maybe I'll just go off and <laughs> get involved in, you know, I'll go you know, everyone else is going off to catch a movie. Well, I'll go do that or what, whatever. I mean, it, it's so easy to then just, just go off on a whim and not give consideration to what you're really doing. But if you already have planned out in advance, well, here's what I'm going to do. In your mind, I'll, like, if I ever get any extra time, this is how I'm going to use it. Then you can just fall right back on that. I've got this Bible memory to do. I've got this, you know, what, whatever you decide. And look, it doesn't always have to be everything is completely uh, set as, you know, um, like your backup plan has to do with serving God. But if it's something that's not wicked and something, you know, something that's not going to keep you from doing, you know, something that's going to keep you from doing bad is going to be a good backup plan. Right. Maybe it's, I know in the back of my mind, I have this work to be done at home. I've got holes to dig. I've got, you know, this other work to be done. That's what I'm going to do if I find myself having an abundance of time. You'll be set. I mean, that's going to help you out tremendously. Now, obviously, the best thing to do is to be serving God with all of your extra time, with all, you know, with all the time that you have. That's the, that's the goal. Again, we're trying to grow towards that. But in order to avoid the idleness and not having things to do, you need to make sure that if something is to come up, you have it already established in your mind, here's what I'm going to do. In this situation, here's what I'm going to do. And have it pre-planned to fall back on that so you don't just say, well, what are we going to do? I don't know. Usually before I get to the weekends, I try to have established, because my wife will ask me, what's your plans for tomorrow? You know, before Saturday, because Saturday is like my only day to do things other than you know, all the work that I have crammed into the rest of my week. So I, I, you know, before I go to bed, I say, you know, I need to have a plan because if I don't have a plan, what's going to happen is I'm going to sleep in. I'm going to not really make use of my time and just do, you know, maybe just spend time surfing online or whatever. And then it's like, oh man, I just wasted my time. I've got all this other work to do. Why didn't I do that? Because I didn't have a plan because I wasn't ready for it. And the more idleness you have, the more you're going to get into stuff that you shouldn't be getting into. Now, I mentioned the men. Women have this problem also, and I think probably even to a little bit of a greater degree. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. You can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. It's the last place I'll have you turn this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now, God's given us different roles. Men are... are being told to go out and to work and to provide for the family. And, you know, we're, we're supposed to be keeping ourselves busy with work. 
Well, women also work and should be working a lot. It's just a different job. They work differently than men. Now, the role that God has given to men is to provide financially for the household, to go, and, go out and bring home the bacon, as it were. You know what I mean? You go, you go out, you earn the money to support your family. And you're working by the sweat of your brow. Just do, you know, do the work that you need to do as well as working for the Lord. Now, women also have a job of working for the Lord, just as men do. But they also, and they, and they also have other work that needs to be do. Now, if we're, if we're following the biblical principles, you know, the Bible is outlining that, that women are to be, you know, keepers at home, you know, obedient to their husbands and raise their family and do, you know, do those types of things. Now, a woman may be a housekeeper. Great, praise God. But they're capable of making sure that the household is in order with plenty of time to spare. And there's many reasons for that, you know, and when there's a, a, you know, everyone's in different situations. With my family, for example, we have a lot of young children. So my wife doesn't find herself with an abundance of idleness because there's just too many things going on all the time. But everyone's in a different stage of their life. And the, the state, you know, just because, you know, when our children grow up and are out of the house, well, guess what? The, the workload is going to be greatly reduced on my wife as far as just making sure the house is in order. So everything could be clean and, and kept up and meals ready and what, you know, whatever, all the things that go along with that and could be done in a, re, you know, in a shorter amount of time because there's not so many things taking your attention. You know, younger families don't have many children, or older family, you know, whatever. Whatever state you're in, you can, be, you can be in the right position and have the right job, but find yourself with more time. And, it, and just as much, I mean, idleness is a problem for men and it's a problem for women. It's a problem for everybody, and idleness is going to be something that could lead you into backsliding because you don't have it planned out what you're going to do with your time. You're a lot more likely to do the wrong thing than to do the right thing. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 13, this is talking about widows, younger widows. Women that have gotten married, they're widowed, they're, you know, they no longer have a husband, and this is, this is the, the advice that's given. This is what's commanded about the younger widows because of what, the, what will end up happening when they're not married, verse 13, and with all they learn to be idle. They learn to be idle because they weren't idle before. Now look, and this goes to the point of what I preach on Father's Day. You know, women that are, or not divorced, but, uh, you know, widowed. Here's his, who in the context. They learn to be idle because their husband isn't there anymore. Now women and men both take heart to this because Men should be making sure that your wives are not idle by providing the work for them so they can't learn to just be idle. But also women, look, maybe your husband's not teaching you not to be idle or not command, you know, whatever, not giving you enough work. You take it upon yourself to make sure you're not idle. You know what I mean? This, 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 is, this goes for everybody. I mean, just as much as a man needs to make sure they're not being idle with their own time, and making and looking out for their family, looking out for the wife. Look, you as an individual, as a, as a wife or whoever, make sure that you don't let yourself get idle because it's, it's going to be a problem. And it says here, they learn to be idle in verse 13, wandering about from house to house and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. So not only are they not even doing anything and not, you know, not using their time wisely at all, they're actually doing bad things because they're tattling, they're busybodies, they're gossiping about people. This is what will naturally end up happening, which is why it's being pre, you know, taught in Scripture that this is what happens and this is why the younger women should marry and bear children and guide the house because if not, this happens. This is what happens. This is human nature. This is the way that the flesh works for the woman. It's, it's, a, it's a clear teaching, which is why we're going over it. And you need to be aware of this so you don't fall into this trap. Verse number 14, I will therefore, because of what he just stated about the, you know, the, the tattlers and the busybodies, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. That's the teaching. That is why women are, are admonished and, and it's the will of God, not just the will of the Apostle Paul, that, that younger women, you know, younger widows get married. Go back to being married and having a husband and do that type of work. And this, 
the, the problem here with the Tyler's and Busybody has gotten so much easier these days with the advent of, of the digital age. Because now you don't even have to physically go from house to house, right? I mean, at least you were restricted before by how far you can get in a day by walking to someone else's house and, and spending the time there. Now you can be going from house to house to house to house to house. Actually, you could be going to thousands of houses really, really quickly and as fast as you can type. It's something to be aware of. You have, to, you have to think about it properly. Just that, you know, this is what's going on, and, and this, is, this is definitely happening today. Is that people are finding this idle time to be tattlers and busybodies without even having to go from house to house physically and you just do it from the, from the comfort of your own. It doesn't make it any less wicked because you're not physically walking to someone else's house. And it makes it even more dangerous because it's so easy to do is better when it makes it harder to actually go out and, and be conscious about leaving your house and doing it. When it's gotten so convenient, it's, it's way more of a problem because the temptation is still always there. But when the, the, the easier it is to sin, the bigger the problem is going to be. I mean, you think about the damage done by a busybody going to a neighbor's house and gossiping, and then just multiply that by how many Facebook friends she has or whatever. Something to be aware of. I mean, just pay attention to your idle time. What are you doing with the time that you have where you don't have the, the job or work to be done that, you, that you're fulfilling, the, 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 the tasks laid out before you? What are you doing with the rest of your time? Make a plan for that. Know how you're going to spend your time, and that'll keep you from backsliding. Uh, Proverbs 31, 27 says, She looketh well to the ways of her household. Again, it's talking about a, a, a wife, the virtuous woman, and eateth not the bread of idleness. And when you read that, that passage, that virtuous woman is busy. She's a very busy woman doing all kinds of work. I mean, her day is spent from waking up early and making sure her household has, has food to going to bed late. Her candle goeth not out by night because she's still working. There is no, no point is her day spent with idleness. No, it's all profitable. It's all productive. There's always things that you can, and there's always things you could be doing. Always good things that you could be doing. But you have to plan out your day because if you just leave these opportunities and these times of idleness, that's when the backsliding starts. That's when you get into that initial sin, but then you want to justify it and then you go down that whole path of how did I end up here? Where if you would just be careful with your time management to begin with, don't open up that door to idleness and, and to backsliding. You need to train yourself to always have a good backup plan, a list of things you need to get done because the time's going to come up when you, when you unexpectedly have that free time. The, uh, the Bible says, I'm going to close on this verse, Proverbs 14, 14. This is the warning to the backslider in heart. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Backslider in heart, <clears throat> it's a heart problem. Problem in your heart, whether or not you, you are actually um, genuinely going forward and trying to serve God or not. If you're backsliding, you've turned your back away from God, you're going to receive of your own ways. The Bible says, just like Israel, I mean, he was, there was a lot of, of um, negativity. There's a lot of judgment coming upon Israel and upon Judah because they were backslidden, because they weren't turning to God. Their ways were, were going to come upon their own head. But, and that's one of the reasons not to backslide to begin with. But if you are backslidden, repent. Turn back to God because that's what he wants. And God will extend mercy unto you. Be, you know, confess and forsake your sins. Stop making excuses. Stop making justification. Stop rationalizing why it's okay for you to not do the work of God or to get, you know, to do whatever it is you're doing that's sinful. You know, just recognize it, acknowledge it, confess it to God, and move forward. Amen. And God will show mercy. I mean, 
It, you, you may still need to have some form of punishment come out, but, but, but just go in the right way and, and, and cut it off. Like, like stop that and, and receive the mercy of God. He wants you to keep moving forward. And don't ever get to the point to where you think, oh, I can't come back to church or whatever. You know, again, is for people sitting in church right now? And if, if anyone happens to listen to this sermon that's not in church right now, that used to come to this church, you know, there is no reason to be ashamed or embarrassed to coming back here. No one's going to, you know, and I don't want anybody ever saying, oh, where have you been? Right. If someone hasn't been in church for a while and then comes back, don't ever say that. I don't ever want to hear anyone saying that in this church. I mean, it's not even funny or a joke. Don't even try to say it like, oh, I'm just joking. Okay, just don't say that. Because it's already hard enough for people to muster up the courage and the humility to come back if they've been gone for, for a while. But if they repented of whatever it is, the reason that got them out of church and they're coming back and they want to serve God, they are welcome back in here. And I don't want anybody trying to make them feel bad about it because if they've already repented, there's no reason to make them feel bad anymore. We're going to accept them back and we're all going to continue moving forward as a church family here. That's the way things are. So if that ever happens to you and you fall out of church, you get involved with some sin, maybe it becomes public, the best thing for you to do is to get right with God and get back in the church because the church is going to here to edify and to comfort and to help you through those difficult times. The hardest thing and the worst thing is to try to dig everything right on your own right. without the support of the body of the body of Christ in the local church. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, all, all of your words, dear Lord. The, the ones that, are, that, are, that we love to hear about your, your long-suffering and your mercy, dear Lord, and also for the, the warnings and the, you know, the reasons why we shouldn't get, get into backsliding and we see these stories of Israel and Judah, dear Lord, and, and how they had turned from you. God, I pray that you please help us to Whenever we do get into these situations where we're getting involved in sin and wickedness in our own life, dear God, that you would help us to turn back to you and to realize the error of our ways that we wouldn't just be completely blinded by our own justifications, but that we can periodically take a step back from our life and just, and just analyze and see where am I? Where am I going? Where have I been before? Am I, am I continuing to, um, to, to increase in my service to you or am I, have I fallen back, dear God? Because we know that they happen. We, we never stay stagnant, uh, not for very long at all. We end up either going forward or backwards, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us all to, to be able to recognize when we start going backward and to have the strength to keep moving forwards. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.